author, Dwight J. Davis Princey of Peace Corps at gmail.com. Copyright Dwight J. Davis, all rights reserved. University of Pentecost.com. Title, The Greatest Sermon Never Told, Summary. Accessing the Healing Virtue of Jesus. Although the Church is rich by focusing on the plan of salvation, we are saved by grace through faith, we are generally ignorant on the restoration grace that is part of Jesus' gospel, healing and miracles. In this teaching, we focus in on the purpose of the Christian healing and miracle ministry and how to activate it in our personal situations and service to those who need a miracle or deliverance by the great physician. When John Baptist was in prison, he desired a confirmation that he had heard correctly. Was Jesus really the Messiah? Jesus rehearsed before John's emissaries, the lame walk, the blind see, the poor have the gospel preached to them. In other words, these are the proofs of authentic Christian ministry. The study of this truth is the key mechanism of great revival. The Triple Payment of the Atonement of Jesus Most in Christianity bypass many of the benefits, Psalm 103 verses 1 to 5, of Jesus beating by the soldiers of Pilate and the victory over the devil's works by the price paid at Jesus' crucifixion. The three purposes of the atonement, propitiation, 1 John 2 verse 22, the suffering and blood of Jesus, are 1. Salvation, the suffering on the cross and victory over Satan and his kingdom 2. Healing, the crown of thorns for emotional and mental illness and stripes of Roman brutality for the healing of all diseases and sickness. Healings are a process of time and faith. 3. Miracles working of instantaneous miracles, cures, and remedies whether physical, emotional, mental, or even provisional. It has occurred that the church world has great faith for saving souls, but has little faith for the signs and wonders of healing, miracles, and deliverances. Why is this? How can this important work be restored? As we will learn, the works of faith that bring divine healing, miracles, and the removal of demonic forces from people's lives are the marks of authentic faith properly equipped believers, Mark 16 verses 16 to 18. Sickness, disease, and death, the works of Satan through unbelief. God formed humans from the clay of the ground, then breathed into their nostrils a life-giving spirit. This united body with spirit, creating a living soul. In creation, animals were also made of clay but do not have the life spirit that humans have. Thus, though they may have intelligence of a kind, they do not have a soul. Angels on the other hand, are pure spirit but do not have a flesh body. Thus, they are not living souls, but living spirits. Keep in mind, that all living souls will be resurrected one day. Some to everlasting life, the first resurrection, and some to everlasting torment, resurrection of the unjust. When the serpent, Seraph, Satan, saw the unique creation of man, it occurred to him that this form of creation was destined to subdue his rebellion and somehow take authority over his domain. Whether jealousy or fear or most likely, a combination of these two unholy virtues, Satan enacted a plan to make living souls part of his fallen rebellious realm. He accomplished this by planting unbelief in God's word within the two innocent victims, Adam and Eve. As we shall see, unbelief is the key works of Satan and his fallen angels, Genesis 3 verses 1 to 5. Notice, therein was the lie which began with a doubtful question, Hath God said, You shall not surely die. This led to disobedience to God's word that in turn, polluted man's environment with the law of sin, that is, knowing good and evil. The father of lies, Satan, tempted the living souls in two ways, one, contradicting God's word and two, the human senses. Temptation of the flesh, the five senses, the fruit looked good and seemed good to eat, accompanies the lie, God is dishonest. You can't trust his word, he has hidden motives. This is the root of unbelief. The purpose of creating humans now becomes clear. God became a man, a living soul, in order to destroy the works of the devil, John 3 verse 8. Now Jesus has passed this work on to faith-filled Christian, John 5 verse 20. John 14 verse 12. Unbelief defined. As an illustration, think of the Spirit of Christ as a very large bottle of wine. 
In order for the wine to pour out of the bottle, the neck of the bottle will have a smaller opening, a place for a stopper or cork. Unbelief creates a very narrow pouring spout, preventing any of the wine from being poured out. Only faith can widen the spout enabling abundant quantities of spiritual wine to be poured out in order to destroy the works of the devil, sickness, disease, death. Page 3 As stated above, unbelief is found in the five human senses of the flesh. 1. Sight 2. Taste 3. Touch 4. Hearing 5. Smell. When the five senses are coupled with a lie or suspicion, unbelief subdues faith. Further, when people are sick or disabled with disease, the five senses become very loud and speak a focus on pain and suffering. Many will say, well it must be God's will for me to suffer, so I will try to be a superb example of non-complaining and just accept my situation. This type of thinking is one of the major reasons why people cannot access the hem of Jesus' garment. Others will say, what about the thorn in Paul's flesh, 2 Corinthians 12 colon 7, wasn't he struck with disease or blindness to keep him humble? When you study the scriptural definition of thorn in the flesh, you will find that it means opposition, an opponent, a message from Satan. It does not mean sickness or blindness. In simplest definition, unbelief is when one does not believe or trust in what the Word of God says when confronted with symptoms of the five senses. Unbelief says, I believe God can do it, but I am not sure He will do it for me. It is difficult for believers and unbelievers alike to have faith in the healing word of God when their symptoms are broadcasting a louder message. The Perfect Will of Jesus Christians go through a process of discovering the will of God, Romans 12 verse 2. It is always God's will to heal and restore our bodies. However, there was only one exception in the ministry of Jesus. It was in, in Nazareth, his hometown. Jesus did not heal all of the sick, diseased, demonically oppressed, or lunatic, mental illness, there. Why? Because of unbelief in him among the community. This speaks volumes about the value of unity among a congregation when it comes to divine healing, deliverance, and miracles. Wherever and whenever Jesus preached the gospel, signs and wonders followed. Divine healing, signs, wonders, deliverances, and salvation are mutual companions of authentic Christianity. Powerless Christianity is not proof of the gospel. It is always the will of Jesus to heal all, if the timing is right, and if preparation for his arrival has been made. To prepare, it is important to pray, repent, and worship. In prayer, we must try to cleanse ourselves from sin and its bedfellow, unbelief. In worship, the presence of Jesus is attracted with a great cloud of witnesses, the angelic host. Once we have met his criteria, note, John the Baptist always preceded Jesus, repentance. Now we are ready to plant the seeds of faith. The Apostle tells us that Jesus, being anointed by God, always delivered people oppressed by the devil, Acts 10.38. Wherever and whenever he arrived, he always did good. Planting the Seeds of Faith In the three parables of the seed, Jesus identifies the work of the seed, Matthew 13. In the first parable, Jesus identifies the four types of soil, 1. Hard soil, 2. Rocky soil, 3. Thorny soil, and 4. Good soil. Jesus explains that the soil is the heart of believers, then he emphasizes that we are to hear. Good soil permits the seed to be planted and as all farmers know, the seed must be watered. The Spirit of Christ is the voice and water that causes the seed to reproduce. Page 4 In the second parable, Jesus identifies weed seeds that reside with the good seed, healthy wheat. The enemy tries to disable the good seed by sowing seeds of unbelief and doubt. Satan does this with the power of his voice being the prince of the power of the air but he is not the rushing mighty wind. In the third parable, Jesus talks about the small mustard seed. He emphasizes that this seed grows into a great tree. When it reaches full maturity, signs and wonders follow. It is Jesus' plan that green grass, that is, new converts, grow up into elders, 
equipped for the works of faith, Romans 1 verse 17. In prayer, when you hear the voice of the Spirit say works, Jesus is talking about a work of faith. In these parables, the Word of God is identified as the seed. When the human heart believes, acquires faith, then the plant reproduces, work of faith. As all farmers know, there is a process in planting the seed. Consider these steps. 1. Study the Word and absorb His promises, the seed, 2 Timothy 2 verse 15. 2. Confess and memorize the Word until the heart believes it, Romans 10 verses 9 to 12. 3. Seek Jesus for faith in the seed. Ask and petition him for a word of faith, Luke 17 verse 5, Matthew 7 verses 7 to 11. That is, if press him, knock on his door, his ears, with all importunity, persistence, not settling for silence from his spirit. This kind of intense effort pleases the Lord. Remember, Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith, Hebrews 12 verse 2. If we do not have a word of faith, he simply has not given it to us. Don't accept failure for a lack of miracles unless of course we have not persisted in prayer. Jesus delights in giving good gifts to believers, especially the gift of faith, a word of faith, a gift of healing, or a word for a miracle, 1 Corinthians 12 verses 4 to 10. When Jesus stated that he desired to drink wine with us in his Father's kingdom, Matthew 26 verse 29, he was identifying faith in the healing and saving power of his blood. We appropriate his blood, this wine, through faith. And faith is always accompanied by a work, an action. When we believe, we either act or speak. But Jesus must send this word of faith after we have planted the seed of belief in our hearts. The seed has life in itself. By planting the seed through study, positive confession and asking, we are ready to receive a gift of healing or a working of a miracle from the mouth of the Lord. Here are some positive confessions. I believe Jesus is going to heal me. I believe Jesus is going to heal you. I believe a miracle is coming. Jesus will send me a word of faith. Jesus always answers prayer for healing. I walk by faith, not by my five senses. All words from Jesus are possible. I will seek, ask, knock until the word of faith comes to me. Two types of believers. Two men at separate times came to Jesus to seek a healing or miracle for someone else. Consider that these two believers are typical of church people praying for the sick and infirmed. Notice the difference in each man. Mark 9 verses 17 to 27. This man stated, if you can do anything and also, help my unbelief. Page 5. Luke 7 verses 1 to 10. The centurion declares, Just say the word and my servant will be healed. These two men represent the faith levels among Christians. The first man carries with him if or more properly, unbelief. He did not have the confidence within himself that Jesus would answer his petition. He was full of unbelief because he had earlier brought his afflicted son to Jesus' disciples who did not have the faith to cast out the devil and heal the man's son. He had encountered powerless Christianity. This man represents church people who have traveled from church to church to seek the real power of divine healing. After many failures, the if of unbelief set in. Jesus did not accept this man's if but replied, if you can believe. In honest sincerity, the man confessed that he had unbelief within himself. Jesus healed that too. On the other hand, the Gentile centurion, sympathetic to the Jews, did not feel himself worthy of approaching Jesus so he sent others. Jesus then came full face to the man who then stated great faith in the word of Jesus. This centurion understood the word of faith. All that he needed was Jesus' word as he understood and believed in the authority of Jesus' commandment. When Jesus found the sick servant of this Gentile, he commanded with authority the sickness to leave. The servant was healed. In these two illustrations, Scripture shows us small faith versus great faith. Both men received a miracle from Jesus. However, it is clear that the man with if-oriented faith first needed his unbelief healed. 
When we have planted the seed of faith and confessed it until we have great faith in it, a miracle will be shortcoming. Let's decide to plant a positive seed in our heart. Anointing for the works of faith, seeking the gifts of the Spirit. Jesus never performed a single miracle until after his water baptism and 40 days of prayer and fasting in the Judean wilderness. At his baptism, John the baptizer heard a voice from heaven while a vision of the Spirit coming upon Jesus, like a dove, was seen. Every Christian should follow the baptism of Peter found in Acts 2 verse 38 as a first step in seeking the anointing of the Spirit for miracles and healing. As we witness in the story of the demon-possessed boy, Matthew 17 verses 14 to 21, the disciples of Jesus were unable to deliver the boy. Frustrated, the father brought the boy to Jesus. The disciples had experience already in healing and deliverance, yet in this case, nothing they did helped the boy. Puzzled, the disciples asked Jesus, why could we not cast it out, meaning the demonic spirit inside the boy? Jesus simply replied, because of your unbelief. Then Jesus states something interesting. This kind does not come out but by prayer and fasting. The anointing to work this faith miracle for the boy required two things, one, prevailing prayer and two, fasting. Prayer and fasting is a cure for unbelief. In his own experience, after 40 days of prayer and fasting in the wilderness, Jesus found himself at a wedding in Cana. The festival ran out of wine and Jesus' mother instructed the servants to do whatever he tells you to do. Jesus felt rushed into his first miracle yet the word of faith came to him from heaven, fill the water pots with water and dip out. The men obeyed the Lord, work of faith, and the water became wine. Not just any wine, but the best wine, John 2 colon 1-12. One other thing, Jesus stated my hour has not come. Anointing has timing along with it obedience by the servant. If we want anointing for works of faith, prayer and fasting will bring the timing forward, in a rush. But remember, do whatever he says to do. One other concept. In Hebrews 12 verses 14 to 15 instructs us to have our character transformed by drawing close to Jesus, holiness, and that bitterness within us, prevents us from accessing the grace of Christ. Grace is accessed by faith. Bitterness, unrepented of anger and hatred, stops many from accessing the healing grace of Jesus that lies unaccessed. Without holiness, removal of bitterness, no one will see God's miracles. How do we know if we are carrying bitterness or hatred in our heart? When we cannot think peaceably about someone who has wronged us in the past. Many Christians have defiled their faith by retaining the right to be offended, angry or upset by. Page 6. Conflicts and Criticisms of the Past. These conflicts may have occurred inside the church or outside, even in family relationships. Reconciliation is one sure cure. Another cure is a great move of the Spirit of Christ. Effective fervent prayer that prevails. In the story of Cornelius, the first Gentile to enter the water and spirit kingdom of Jesus, Acts 10 verses 1 to 48, we see divine orchestration in response to prevailing prayer. Cornelius continually prayed until the vision came. Simultaneously, Peter received the vision of the unclean animals in the tablecloth. Notice that Jesus and his angels do not preach the gospel, but this is given exclusively to his human blood-bought disciples. What if Cornelius had stopped praying after his first petition? Would the two visions have arrived at all? Prevailing prayer is when one persists in petition to the Lord, as the story of the woman of importunity demonstrates. If a persisting woman can cause an unjust judge to act, what can persistent prevailing prayer do with a just judge? Many people are not healed or given the deliverance promised in the gospel because they give up too soon as they wait upon God. A high level of faith keeps knocking on the door for a loaf of bread, a word of faith, until God relents and sends the gift of faith, word of faith, gift of healing, or working of miracles. We should always keep knocking until we hear the words my grace is sufficient for thee. This phrase tells us to stop knocking. Because of his great compassion, mercy, loving kindness, it is Jesus' desire to heal us. 
We are the temple of the Holy Spirit and it's God's desire to do maintenance on his building. Elijah didn't quit praying until he saw the small dark cloud forming over the horizon, the harbinger of rain. He prevailed. The letter of James tells us that effective prayer prevails and is fervent. A fervent prayer is one that persists, often in travail, until God responds. This kind of prayer avails much, James 5 verses 10 to 18. Job also persevered in prayer, especially for his condemning friends, intercession, until he was restored and made even more fruitful. In this great passage in James 5, several apostolic instructions are given to us. 1. Persevere in prayer 2. Pray until something happens, p.u.s.h, 3. Call for elders, experienced in works of faith, let them anoint you with oil to be healed. 4. Confess our faults, weakness in faith, unbelief, to one another. 5. Wait for the word of faith then pray it. The prayer of faith saves the sick. 6. When the word of faith comes, command it to happen in the name of Jesus. Whatever we do in word of deed should be done in the name of Jesus, Colossians 3 verse 17. 7. Give thanks to Jesus and accredit him with all the glory. Don't get puffed up if Jesus uses us as a conduit for a miracle. The miracle pattern at the temple, Acts 3 colon 1 4 31. Immediately after Peter's powerful Pentecost, GK, 50, sermon, possibly a few days following the holiday, Shavuot, Feast of Weeks, in Jerusalem, a miracle pattern was established for authentic Christianity. A paralyzed man, 40 years old, unable to walk from birth, was encountered begging at the beautiful gate leading into the temple. This man, expecting money from Peter and John, was unexpectedly about to receive a miracle that would remove his need to beg. Consider that Jesus had passed by this man several times before as it was the paralyzed man's tradition to beg for money at all Jewish religious festivals. The crowds were huge at those times and people in general felt more compassionate toward the unfortunate during those times of religious piety. This situation is a noteworthy pattern for all Christians for several reasons, it is important to read the passage of this miracle in order to be prepared to understand its principles. Page 7 1. The paralyzed man was well known in Jerusalem as were his parents who were alive at the time of his miracle. 2. Jesus himself most likely knew of the man and may have previously given him money while passing him by on his way up to the temple. 3. Peter and John were broke. If they had possessed money, possibly no miracle would have occurred. 4. Two disciples of Jesus were going up to the temple to pray. Jesus always taught his disciples to minister two by two. The principle? One can put a thousand to flight, two ten thousand. Also, where two or more are gathered in my name, there am I. 5. It is obvious that a word of faith came to Peter at the moment the paralyzed man begged for money. Peter was given the keys to the kingdom by Jesus, Matthew 16 verses 16-18 and showed all of Christianity how to access the grace of salvation, Acts 2 verse 38. He now will introduce us on how to access the grace of healings, signs, and wonders from Jesus' thorns and stripes. 6. Peter identified the name of Jesus as the one name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, as the way to have. 1. Sins removed in water baptism. Now he will reveal the use of the name of Jesus in miraculous power as a companion of the word of faith that encouraged him to speak out and command the paralyzed man to walk. 7. This notable miracle was in fact a public sign. The testimony was visible and spread quickly as the formerly paralyzed beggar walked onto the temple platform, Solomon's porch, showing himself healed. With appreciation. He rehearsed his miracle to all who would listen, declaring that that the followers of Jesus, using the name of Jesus, resurrected him from begging. He was now employable. This public miracle caused 5,000 Jews to become believers in Christ. This event gives us a pattern of great revival. 8. Peter and John emphatically declared to all that they in themselves had no power or authority to perform this miracle. They humbly gave all glory to Jesus, unlike some of the modern mass healing evangelists.
who have made a business out of healing the needy. The no notable statement in this episode is found in Acts 4 verses 8 to 12. It is the important capstone to all miraculous healings enacted by authentic Christians. This statement proves the purpose of healings, miracles, signs, and wonders. It is the statement of salvation. Consider what Peter exclaimed to the Sanhedrin and ruling priests of Jerusalem. Acts 4 verses 8 to 12 Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man, by what means he has been made well, let it be known to you all, and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands here before you whole. This is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. After threatening Peter and John to stop speaking in the name of Jesus, the holding cell where they were being kept was shaken and extreme anointed boldness came upon the two men. They would need this zeal in order to complete the harvest of the five thousand men, not including the women and children, who became believers after seeing this miraculous work of faith. The miracle of the paralyzed man is a pattern for all authentic Christians to follow. Plant seeds of faith and believe in the authority, saving, healing, and miraculous power of Jesus' name when we are called to demonstrate the proof of Jesus' resurrection, that is, ministering healing. When ministers do not link the name of Jesus for its use in salvation to all healings, miracles, signs and wonders, the miracle becomes a lying sign and wonder. Acts 2 verse 38 must always be preached to anyone who is a recipient of the healing grace of Jesus' atoning work. Page 8. Waiting on the Lord. If we have planted the seeds of faith, made positive confession of that faith, then persisted in the ASK process of effectual fervent prayer, then we can expect a word of faith to arrive. However, we cannot dictate to the sovereign all-wise God when that word of faith will arrive, but it will. That is, timing. In Genesis 18 verse 14, Sarah is confronted for laughing at the word of God. The biblical translators have hidden from us the conversation of the Lord to her in reprimand. The Lord stated to her, Is anything, Davar, word, too hard for God? Yes, is any word too hard for God? The angel Gabriel stated the same phrase to Mary while informing her of the miraculous conception that is about to occur. For with God no thing, Rima, word, shall be impossible. Luke 1 verses 34 to 38. Mary replied, Be it unto me according to your word. As scripture tells us, Jesus was born at the fullness of time. That is, conditions of the willing had arrived. Namely, Zacharias and Elizabeth, John Baptist parents, and Mary of Nazareth, a willing participant in God's plan. And so we continue to experience God's sovereign timing. We renew strength when we wait upon the Lord, Isaiah 40 31. Wait for the word of faith, the word of healing, and the work of a miracle. Be ready to obey when until it comes. This called, the word of patience, Revelation 3 verse 10. Written June 20, 2022.